It's a leafy suburb in Cheshire. Sale is a nice suburban area of Manchester. It's wealthy, it's a place that people aspire to live. Good schools, uh, good shops, um, quite a nice area. Armsby Avenue is typical, quiet, unassuming. It sometimes amazes you what, what actually goes on behind closed doors. That was certainly true of number 77 Armsby Avenue and the couple who lived there. 38-year-old Tracy Seward was a housewife and mother to three children, but she had another life on the internet and even another name. There's a number of videos that were recovered showing a variety of things. To her male fans all over the world, Tracy was known as Stiletto. That gives her an image, it creates a fantasy. Stiletto had so much power over her internet admirers that they called her the goddess and would do anything for her. water park, a place where families go kayaking and sailing. But below the surface, the waters held a hidden secret. We were searching with our hands, uh, more or less patting as, as you go along. Police frogmen retrieved mysterious lumps of concrete, which they brought to the surface for further examination. And that was the point at which we were able as a team then to think, OK, this is, uh, you know, we've got We've got something we can really work with now. What they found was a vital clue in a tale of betrayal, domination, and ultimately, death. Armsby Avenue in suburban Sale was the family home to Tracy Seward and her partner of 20 years, Philip Briley. Philip and Tracy were childhood sweethearts. They'd met when she was 14, they'd fallen in love. They bought themselves a house, they moved to a nice part of Manchester, um, and they, they had um, what they you know, enjoyed as a really good life together. The couple had three children, and the family moved from ashton under Lyne to Sale, a more middle-class suburb of Manchester with better schools. To the outside world, everything was perfect. But on the 11th of June 2001, 42-year-old Briley disappeared from his family home in suburban Sale. Remarkably, his partner Tracy didn't seem too concerned, but Philip's sister, Christine, was worried. Philip's sister was the one that had last seen him. Um, it was so out of character for him not to make contact with her, with the family. She really felt strongly that there was something wrong. Something, a gut instinct, I think, told her that something was very wrong. And she took it upon herself to push Tracy to inform the police that he'd gone missing. Under pressure from Christine, Tracy Seward eventually reported Philip Riley's disappearance to Greater Manchester Police. Police officers went to the house shortly after Tracy contacted us, which was a week after Philip's disappearance. In the initial inquiries, they just found it was a normal suburban house in, in Manchester. The police weren't unduly alarmed, especially when they were told why Philip had left. Tracy's version of events uh, that she uh, provided to the officers was that uh, her and Philip had had a, a row uh, late one evening into the early hours of the following morning, which, which wasn't, as she said, unusual. Uh, in their relationship, uh, and the culmination of that row, he'd uh, packed his bags, got into a, his car and, and driven off, uh, and she hadn't seen him since. My suspicions were aroused right at the very beginning of it, because we get so many missing from homes. He was an adult male, um, he was, had wife and children, and these things do happen. It is quite a regular occurrence for adults to go missing, uh, and a week's disappearance from an adult is, is not uh, particularly unique. But when Philip missed his youngest son's birthday two weeks later, his sister became even more anxious. This was just so out of character for Philip, he, just something that he would never have done. Um, there was no phone call, there was no contact. Um, and the fact that Tracy didn't seem to be too concerned about this, I think, was the, the element that the family found so disturbing. They, they couldn't understand why 
um, she didn't seem concerned that he'd gone away and, and had missed this important birthday. Detectives first became suspicious when they discovered that Tracy had changed all the bills into her name and that Philip had left his mobile phone behind. If people are, are going to go missing in the circumstances that Tracy suggested, uh, we would have expected he would have taken his mobile phone with him. And clearly, it, it was so unusual that he, he didn't have any contact with his, his other family that, that didn't live too far away. Uh, he, he was a man who did keep in touch with his, his, his family from, from his own side. Wherever he went, he always had the phone with him. So that was a major concern to us. And when we followed the contacts from the phone to his associates, they reinforced that concern that Philip would just never leave his phone. He's always with him. The police decided it was time to pay another visit to the couple's home in Armsby Avenue. They carried out a search and were surprised at what they found. There's a number of videos that were recovered which showed um, different sexual practices which aren't commonly practiced or even known about um, across the country. The videos revealed the bizarre second life of Tracy Seward. She had her own website, and on it she wasn't Tracy, she was Stiletto. On the internet, she was a dominatrix, there to fulfill the desires of men interested in bondage and sadomasochism. Detectives discovered that the garage of her home had been turned into a film set where the perverted movies were shot. One of them was obviously filmed in the garage of the address, and it involved Tracy dressed in various guises. But even hardened detectives were not prepared for what some of the videos contained. Some of them were really graphic. One of them, she was crushing small invertebrates like wood lice and worms and things like that. It was quite disturbing watching those videos. Crush it! Crush it! Crush it! In June 2001, 42-year-old Philip Riley went missing from his home in the greater Manchester suburb of Sale. Detectives investigating his disappearance soon discovered the missing man's partner, Tracy Seward, was not a typical suburban housewife. Tracy, on the internet, was known as Stiletto. She was known as a sadomasochist and a dominatrix, and that meant that the people that she met, the men, it was men that she met on the internet, who couldn't find that kind of sexual gratification anywhere else became gradually under her control. You can take a personality on the internet which doesn't necessarily relate to your real life personality. So for example, Seward was known as Stiletto on the internet. That gives her an image, it creates a fantasy, it heightens the fantasy. Often you can say things on the internet which aren't at all true. And what that seems to do is to serve to heighten the awareness of what might be going on, to heighten the experience of being dominated so that you take it to a different level, that it no longer remains a fantasy which is private and secret and sometimes furtive, but might be a fantasy which can be made real and go to the next level. As a dominatrix, Tracy Seward specialised in a rare sexual fetish called crushing. At its tamest, Tracy was pictured crushing inanimate objects, but she also regularly used her stilettos on living creatures. Crushing is simply those people who will take an interest in a woman wearing very kind of stylized shoes, crushing small animals, killing them. It's almost a snuff movie for animals. I think it was a uh, first time, certainly a lot of the officers and I had come across this particular fetish uh, of crushing small animals. Uh, clearly quite sickening in many ways to, to look at these sort of images. And it really gave the insight into what Tracy was all about. The fact that she was prepared to do these things, which very few people, women, would want to do. And the fact that she then became dominant and controlling over the people that wanted these things done, but found it very hard to find a dominatrix who would do it to them. 
Detectives discovered Tracy's persona as the internet dominatrix Stiletto had started at home with Philip as a sexual fetish the couple shared. The couple then began taking photos and videos of Tracy in her role as Stiletto and selling them on the internet. Some men, especially men often who are, uh, have power in their working lives, like to be dominated. It's a way of relieving stress. Some men who like to be dominated like to be dominated because they have always been dominated by a more powerful woman in their lives, not necessarily a mother, perhaps a sister, perhaps a girlfriend. So the, the range of behaviours that can lead a man to want to be dominated are as varied as the number of men themselves. Within a short time, Tracy had become an internet porn star with a number of totally obsessed male followers around the world who were, in some cases, virtual slaves. They even wore t-shirts printed with the words, property of the goddess. The internet's ability to allow people to make contact can bring with it some very difficult consequences for us as a society, as a culture, in how to manage those people with like-minded interests that might become too extreme. The maid is really worried about what else she may well have on those videos and what she was doing with her other clients. The detectives found Tracy had become particularly close to one of her internet fans, a 26-year-old Swiss man called Jonah Previtelli. The relationship developed into a full-blown affair, and at one point she went to live with him in Switzerland. It was a love triangle. She'd actually um, got in with a younger man, um, was obviously having a really good time. He had a big house, he had a swimming pool in the garden, and she liked the life, she enjoyed the life, she wanted the life, and I think that um, Philip was being left behind. Um, he was at home, he was caring for the children, he was making sure that their needs were being met. But Briarly wanted Tracy back, despite warnings from his relatives. Family were putting pressure onto him to say, look, just get rid of Tracy, just let her go. It's easier to let her go than try and force her to come back and, you know, have a stormy relationship. But no, he wanted her back. Tracy did come back. She told Philip that her affair with Previtelli was over and she gave the same story to police investigating his disappearance. But detectives were about to find out that not everything Tracy told them was true. The biggest breakthrough for me in this investigation while it was a mission from home was the finding of Philip's burnt-out car. Tracy had told the police that when Philip stormed out, he had taken his car with him. This presented us with a direct contradiction to Tracy's account, uh, really, as to him having gone abroad with his car and the fact there was no reports from him, from Philip, about the theft, potentially, or the, the burning out of this car. That was a very, very strong signal to me. It wasn't good news. It made us more concerned for Philip. We now had his phone. We now had his car burnt out. We had no indication anywhere that he was still alive, so it gave us grave concerns for Philip Reilly's welfare. I started to form the opinion there and then that Philip was actually dead, uh, and if he was dead, then the investigation had to take on a new form to find out who had actually killed him. Once again, the detective team returned to call on Tracy Seward, and once again, they were in for a surprise discovery. We went there early one morning, knocked on the door, went in, and we found Tracy in bed with her lover, Previtali, which was brilliant for us. The man between the sheets was Tracy's 26-year-old Swiss toy boy, Jonah Previtelli. We first heard the name Previtelli mentioned uh, as part of the Missing From Home inquiry as we tried to get more information about uh, Tracy's background and the, the relationship she had with Philip. She mentioned the fact that she'd had uh, a relationship with Previtelli, that Philip had known about that relationship, and Philip, in turn, had known, as she said, that, that she had finished that relationship with Previtelli. It was clear that by the fact that Tracy was in bed with her lover that neither of them were concerned that Philip really was going to come back in the house. The couple's relationship was clearly back on, giving them a motive to kill Philip Briley. Detectives decided they had enough evidence to arrest them for questioning. 
at that point we knew absolutely very really virtually nothing about Previtali at all other than again what Trace had told us that uh, he was a Swiss national with whom she'd met uh, on the internet in their fetish of, of S&M uh, and that she'd had a relationship with him and, and beyond that we knew very little about him at that time when he was first arrested. The arrest was really the start of the next phase of the inquiry and really we knew, we were convinced that they knew something. Exactly what their involvement was we weren't 100% of but we knew something was really, really wrong. But we didn't know what, we didn't know where it happened and we didn't know what the involvement was of these two people though we knew it was quite heavy. But when they were questioned at Altrincham Police Station, Tracy Seward and Jonah Prevatelli didn't give detectives any new information. Both Tracy and Prevatelli were very calm during their stay in custody. They gave the impression that they'd had done nothing wrong. They were uh, very intelligent and cool and calm and collected. And clearly we were looking for a breakthrough in the case by the initial interviews of them both. Uh, unfortunately, uh, over the first period of interviews, first day or so, uh, we didn't get any great cooperation from either of them which took the investigation any further forward. After several hours of questioning and with no new evidence, Greater Manchester Police faced the prospect of having to release the couple. We didn't expect to be able to keep them in, which was pretty frustrating for the whole investigative team because you had people in who you knew, both Prevatali and Seward, who were involved in the disappearance of Brearley. And at that time, we were pretty convinced it was a murder and you're going to have to let them go, so it was pretty frustrating. But just as the detectives were about to set the couple free, they had a stroke of luck. And in an amazing coincidence, it was one of their own policemen who gave the inquiry team a vital clue. Had a look on the board, we have a big whiteboard. And I noticed there were two people with uh, murder next to their names. I walked down one corridor and had a look in, uh, in through the hatch, put a, a face to a name. I saw. Previtali in there uh, looked and I realised that I recognised him straight away. When I looked at him, I thought, where have I saw you from? Then PC Trigg remembered why Previtali looked so familiar. <laughs> Two weeks earlier, and whilst he was off duty, PC Trigg had been jogging near a water park and canal system in Sale. He saw a car that aroused his suspicions. I came across this bridge here. As I came across, I noticed a, a vehicle. It was a purple vehicle. There was a man stood next to it, had a long trench coat on. It just seemed really odd to be in the location that he was. Um, so as I, I ran past, I noted the, the vehicle and the part of the registration, thinking that, you know, something might be going on here. It was very strange. PC Trigg continued his jog and was surprised to come across the same vehicle again. This time, he saw two men. Suspicions are aroused even more now. I'm thinking, why has this vehicle changed locations? So I thought, when I'd run up towards the vehicle, make a mental note or get out of the registration. As I got to the vehicle, the had the backs towards me and they were sat on the, the boot of the car, the hatchback of the vehicle. When I ran past and I got that glance and I did see, I did realise it was the same guy that I saw in the same location as well as the vehicle. I got to about 200 yards away when I heard a loud splash. It was obvious that something had been thrown into the water. One of the men PC Trigg saw was Prevatelli, now locked up in Altrincham Police Station. The significance of the evidence from PC Trigg uh, was uh, crucial, really, I think, at that stage to the role that Prevatelli had played in our ability to introduce evidence about Prevatelli's role. We could then put Prevatelli at a scene. We weren't quite sure where the scene was there or what was in the water at that time, but it was the next building block, if you like, to put in a case against Prevatali. Prevatali answered no comment to virtually all the questions in the interview, but when we put to him the fact that he'd been seen throwing a bin into the canal, um, he admitted that he was there and he admitted that the fact that he'd helped some, his friend clean out the garage and was helping him dispose fly tipping, if you like, into the canal. Prevatelli's story didn't ring true. So why was he by the canal that day and who was the man with him? Detectives were about to get both those questions answered in dramatic fashion.
We'd all been on duty for quite a considerable amount of time. We were getting nothing from the interviews. We had no more evidence or intelligence that we had when we went to the address in the morning. And we were really starting to think about where we we're going to bail these people, where we we're going to release them, what's the next step. And then we get told about an email from America. When I read the email, it was one of those uh, eureka moments, I guess. I think that's the best way to describe it. The email was sent from a man in America called Sean, and his evidence was to provide a crucial breakthrough. Sean regularly visited the same S&M chat rooms on the internet that were used by Tracy Seward and her fans, and had come across disturbing accounts of the brutal murder of an Englishman called Philip Brierley. Was it a sick fantasy, or could it be true? We had an account of what had happened to Philip, and what he wanted to do, what he was looking to do, was to see whether there's any substance to the, the bizarre account that he'd had. So we'd been looking in local publications uh, in England on the internet for whether Philip Brearley was in the press as a, a reported missing person. There were no newspaper reports about Philip Brearley, so Sean then contacted a number of different British police forces to see if they knew whether a crime had really been committed. He didn't know whether Philip Brearley had been murdered, although he'd been told he'd been murdered. And really, I think he was after reassurance that what he'd been told over the internet was going to be pure fantasy. Sean told detectives that according to the account on the internet, Philip Brierley had been killed, dismembered, and his body parts had been covered in cement. Sean had something more, the name of one of the people involved in the gruesome murder plot. Sean mentioned to us quite a lot of the detail of, of what he had heard uh, had happened to Philip. Uh, and, and clearly, and most interestingly, uh, uh, at that stage, I guess, he introduced the name Chris. Sean told us that Chris was a night watchman in a local disused garage. Sale in Altrincham is a pretty um, small area where there are not that many disused garages, and when we put that out to the team, they immediately put it together as Chris Cassidy. Chris Cassidy was a friend of both Tracy Seward's and Philip Riley's. Chris Cassidy struck me as an unusual character. He, he'd become very close to Seward's daughter, and she used to call him Dad. But it was clear that the magnetism of Seward that led him to become involved. Chris Cassidy uh, had, had come across the officers at the time when they were searching uh, Tracy's home address and was somebody who immediately arose suspicion in the officers that he knew something about what had taken place. They remember him being very panicky, being very unsettled, but, but rather than avoiding the police, he seemed to want to engage with the police as if almost trying to find out what the investigation was doing and where it was going. The reason for Cassidy's curiosity was about to become clear. Police investigating the disappearance of 42-year-old Philip Briley from Sale in Manchester had just received vital information in an email from America. It led them to arrest a night watchman called Chris Cassidy and search his home. The most significant item found at his home, which really excited us, was a receipt from a local builder's merchants for some uh, cement. Uh, and the date uh, of the purchase of that was, was in the week. Uh, immediately uh, following Philip's disappearance. The receipt led detectives to a builder's yard near Cassidy's home, and the staff there remembered him and his rather odd behaviour. He came in and looked like a jobbing builder. He uh, asked for rapid set cement, plastic sheeting and gaffer tape. There was actually two purchases of, of cement that Cassidy had done, and in particular the builders' merchants, remember, they bought one lot and then the same day they'd rang up in panic wanting another lot, just as the, the, the merchants were about to close and they'd, they'd almost pleaded with them to stay open. The reason he gave that he was coming back was he'd run out of um, cement and he needed to finish the job that day. I got the cement ready and put it by the gate and he didn't turn up till about ten past five. We took the money off him. He, he wouldn't bother about the money. He let us keep the change and everything. Cassidy couldn't give us any truthful or viable reason why he would want that cement in such extreme, panicky circumstances, and that line of inquiry was, was really 
putting pressure on him. Cassidy had an anxious wait as skeptical detectives began to check further into his unconvincing excuses. Cassidy hadn't been able to sleep at night. He was really troubled by what had happened and he wanted to get this off his chest. Through him and his solicitor, we got an agreement from him that he would take us out then and there, uh, take out the officers to the scenes where he uh, would indicate to us where Philip's dismembered body had been placed. Cassidy said he was going to take us to um, Sale Water Park. He was going to identify the place where the body had been thrown into the river. So we set off in about three motor vehicles. The first ones um, with police officers in, the second one with Cassidy and with a police officer, um, the solicitor was in there as well, and I was following behind in the rear car. We went down to Sale Water Park, which is kind of a rural place, and eventually we all turned into a, a place near the river and everybody gets out. He took us to the side of the, the Bridgewater Canal and indicated to us, in brief terms, this is where he'd put the parts of Philip's body that he'd disposed of. Clearly, what was going through my mind then, you know, was this a genuine account we got from Cassidy, OK, taking us out and showing us things, he told us things. We had other accounts, but until such time as you got a, uh, some evidence of what had taken place, it was still only in a story. To find out if Cassidy's story was genuine, Greater Manchester Police's underwater search team were called in. We were to meet down at the canal bank in Sale the following day where underwater search unit divers were going to look for a body. To be honest, we didn't know whether we were going to find anything. We had lots of brickwork down there. As you can appreciate all the brickwork around here all the, during the construction of all this, um, there was lots of extra bricks and boulders and things. We were searching with our hands, uh, more or less patting as, as you go along. If the diver actually indicates a find and it's what you're looking for, it's, it's, it's a real surprise. When the first piece of concrete came, came up, the diver indicated a find. I got it to the side, um, and we had the forensic team there, and I got it out of the water with their help. Placed it on a piece of plastic that we'd, we had at the side of the bank. It was as if it was a sculptor's pre-modelling moulded bit of clay, if you like. Turned it over and, and inside was what looked like a part of a human limb. I think it was the bit I found, which was uh, indeed the head. It was like a, a circle, if you like, or, or a sphere with sloping shoulders. Uh, I think ultimately it was found that there was indeed a head inside. And that was the point at which we were able as a team then to think, OK, this is, uh, you know, we've got, we've got something we can really work with now. Cassidy's story seemed to be stacking up. He'd incriminated himself, but refused at this stage to tell police who else was involved in the murder plot. We're in a position to charge uh, Cassidy with murder based on, on his initial account to us. We were only able to charge Prevotelli at that stage with assisting an offender, and that was largely due to the evidence of PC Trigg, having seen him deposit stuff in the river. We were concerned. We were really concerned after we had charged the first two and as time went on whether or not we would have enough to charge Tracy Seward and we had to have meetings with council, we had to review evidence um, and we also were really, really hopeful that Cassidy would eventually give us a statement, which he did. Chris Cassidy decided to tell the full story from the beginning. Tracy approached me as I was giving her a lift in my car. I was constantly having Tracy describe to me how bad life was with Phil. Tracy said she was being forced to make fetish videos for Phil. She asked me if I would kill Phil. 
the pressure from her became constant. Cassidy gave in to the constant pressure from Tracy and agreed that he would carry out the killing. She told him her young lover, Jonah Previtelli, would supply the murder weapon. Johnny Previtelli contacted me, saying that he'd got a small handgun and that it looked like a toy. He'd also got 48 bullets for the gun and he said that it was a revolver. He'd bought a candle holder and he'd modified the bottom putting in a metal plate so that he could put the gun inside. Privatali told me that he would send the candle holder through the post to me home in sale and that the gun would be inside. As they drove home from an evening at Philip's sister's house on the 11th of June 2001, Tracy Seward persuaded Philip that they should drop in to see their friend Chris Cassidy, who was on duty as a night watchman at a disused garage in Altrincham. I opened the door and they both came in. Phil asked if he could have a look around the workshop and I agreed. He left Tracy with me and I asked her if she still wanted it doing. She said, yes, it's the only way we will be free. As we walked into the rear garage area, Tracy fell. She was lying on the floor. Philip knelt down saying, come on Tracy, get up. I had taken the gun from my right pocket and as his back was towards me, I fired one shot into the back of his head. I remember the loud bang. Philip brought his left hand to the back of his head and he just looked at me as if to say, you bastard. When we got the statement from Cassidy, uh, the detail of it, which read like a novel in a lot of ways, pieced it all together and we had the view from the inside of what was going on, and it made an enormous difference. Cassidy admitted shooting another three bullets into Philip's head. He said Seward then helped him roll the body up in plastic sheeting and put it into Briarley's car, which they drove back to Arnsby Avenue in Sale. The body stayed in the boot of the ordinary family car for two days, until Previtelli flew over from Switzerland to help them dispose of it. We believe that their plan was to bury the body, but Previtali was adamant that he was going to dismember the body. For some reason, he just wanted to do that. Whether it was his hatred towards Brearley, what it was motivating him, we don't know, but he found a disused saw in the garage, and he set up about sawing the body apart, chopped the head off, chopped the arms off, chopped the legs off, and then cut the torso in two, which was an incredibly gruesome way of disposing of a body. Jonah cut through Philip's right shoulder to take off his arm. I started heaving. I threw up in the showroom. Then came a moment when it seemed their carefully laid plans were about to fall apart when a police car drew up outside. After about an hour and a half of Jonah soaring, as I stood in the showroom, I saw a police car pull onto the car park by the top entrance. Priva Tali came into the showroom saying what hard work it was and I told him that the police were on the car park. But it turned out that the local police had arrived just to set up a speed trap and not to investigate the macabre goings on at the back of the building. Privatali saw the police and just shrugged his shoulders and went to carry on. To complete the grim ritual in a manner more suited to the mafia, the two men bought quick drying cement from a builder's yard. They encased each of the body parts in the concrete and dumped them in what they hoped would be their final resting place. The police frogmen changed all that, but once they had recovered the concrete blocks, detectives still faced a major problem, how to carry out a proper post-mortem. What it prompted us to do was, was to try and find some equipment that could actually X-ray the concrete blocks to give us a start point, or to give the pathologist a start point in how to actually open out the, uh, the piece of cement. We actually got some equipment sent to us that had been used on the Rosemary West and Fred West murder investigation, some X-ray equipment that had been used there. It's a device which they use to um, penetrate walls, an x-ray device, and to search behind walls searching for bodies or skeletons. 
we set the pieces of concrete in front of this detection device and they imaged through the concrete and the results that were produced were absolutely fantastic. The device was so powerful that police had to evacuate part of the area around the hospital mortuary because of potential dangers from the x-rays. You could actually see right through the concrete and in one of the pieces there were um, arms and legs. We also had a, a bin that was recovered in which there was part of the torso uh, of a body as well. And the strange thing was that when you looked at the actual x-ray images you could actually see the watch on the wrist, clearly see the watch on the wrist of um, the arm and in one of the other pieces you could see the shoes and you could actually read the name of the shoes because there was a metal, the, the name plate on the side of the shoes was made of metal and you could actually read the name. So it, it gave us a really good clue as to what was inside and the best way to go about trying to get them out of the actual pieces of concrete. Then the x-ray revealed something that was critical to the inquiry. We looked at uh, the, the bell-shaped piece of concrete which, we, which, which actually contained the head um, and the x-ray image revealed inside some dark, very small dark pieces um, and I think that everyone came to the conclusion that they were probably bullets uh, although we didn't know until we actually excavated, found them and had a look at them um, but it enabled us to see without even opening the piece of concrete what was inside and the fact that there were some very dense metallic objects inside which we thought were bullets. We actually brought a, a Kango hammer to the post-mortem as well as an, uh, a range of sort of diamond cutting tools. In the end, um, because we knew where everything was, we were able to decide where we were going to make the cut and uh, open it up and, and reveal what was inside. Clearly what we had to do was make sure we had all the evidence recovered and through the, the process of x-ray, the lumps of concrete, managing to open the, the lumps of concrete, managing to, to conduct the post-mortem, we were satisfied that we would actually recovered all the parts of uh, Philip's body uh, and, and we were satisfied and, and uh, that we had done so. Chris Cassidy had already been charged with Philip's murder. Now detectives had enough evidence to also charge Jonah Previtelli. Tracy Seward continued to try to convince those around her she was innocent. My memories of Tracy are just somebody who was in control. Um, somebody, uh, when I used to visit, I used to visit sort of without giving warning, really, so that I could see who was at the address when I arrived, if there were any cars parked outside that were unusual, if she received any telephone calls while I was there. Um, but she was very not secretive, but very clever at um, allowing me to see what she wanted me to see within the house and then for me to go. Um, and I think the way she presented herself was just the grieving widow. Detectives were gradually piecing together the evidence that would shatter Tracy's carefully constructed image. The investigation really had to concentrate, part of the investigation had to concentrate on the sequence of events that, that we could prove uh, and where Tracy fitted into those sequence of events and try and work out from that what evidence we could actually get. A large part of that was, was really looking at the sequence of phone calls uh, between Tracy and, uh, and Previtali uh, in Switzerland on the night that Philip was murdered. And it was that really that provided the breakthrough and we'd actually got that in, in, in evidence. We were able to then charge Tracy with murder. But there was to be one final twist in the tape. Even more damning evidence about Tracy's role was about to be revealed by another of her internet slaves. Police investigating the murder of 42-year-old Philip Riley from Cheshire were close to the end game. They had already charged Tracy Seward and two of the men she dominated with the recent killing. Then they uncovered the role in the murder plot of another of Tracy's internet devotees, Roel Thomason. Our investigation concentrated on others who were part of the close network of Philip and Tracy, and, and we came across Raoul Thomason, a man who was living in Holland at that time. Thomason was a, a train driver in Holland who was an internet porn addict, this type of porn that uh, Tracy Seward uh, cultivated. I think he too, in his own way, was infatuated with 
Tracy Seward. What made Roald Thomason's name stand out is that detectives found that he had sent money to Tracy Seward and was in constant touch on the phone. On one occasion, he called her 32 times in one day. It was clear from our investigation that Tracy had had a form of relationship with Thomason uh, and it was clear to us that Thomason was absolutely besotted with Tracy uh, and would do anything for her. He was we uh, really close to the, the conspiracy uh, and had offered to help Tracy in the past to get rid of Philip by different means at different dates. Tracy Seward convinced Thomason that he was the object of her affections and that Prevatelli was no longer on the scene. He'd have been involved in the planning of the murder in a lot of different ways, but hadn't actually taken part in the killing itself. So, for example, he'd sent over to England uh, sleeping pills, which were administered to Briarley uh, unsuccessfully. He, he'd also planned to send over a sawn-off shotgun to be used in the killing, and he'd financed various aspects of the killing also. He agreed to come over and tidy up the murder scene after Briarley had been murdered. In effect, he agreed to do all these things, but the final stage of coming over and clearing up, he found he couldn't, just couldn't do it. With Thomason's evidence and Cassidy's confession, the net had finally closed in on Tracy Seward. And on the day their trial was due to open, she and her lover, Jonah Prevatelli, admitted they were guilty of murder. Due a large part to the efforts of Chris Cassidy in giving us a statement, uh, and due to what I think was a, a really professional investigation that, that, that recovered evidence from five or six different countries in America, in Europe and in England, uh, they, uh, Cassidy, uh, Prevatelli and uh, Tracy Seward were in a position where they had no real uh, option but to plead guilty, which they did do so. When they all pleaded guilty, I took that as recognition that the case that the whole team had put together had been done in the most appropriate, meticulous, in detailed way that left her nowhere else to go. After extradition from Holland, Roel Thomason, the slave, was sent to prison for eight years for his part in the crime. Jonah Prevatelli, the lover, was given a life sentence, as was Chris Cassidy, the man who actually pulled the trigger. Three men, their lives devastated by their involvement with Tracy Seward. Seward was a very cunning woman and She'd set up a trap that she led her husband into to his death at the disused garage. And I think she was keen to involve other people and was able to do that because she was such a powerful personality. She got three men to murder for her. And that has got to be an extreme example of dominating somebody, including somebody who had no background. In fact, none of them had any real background in criminality. None of them were murderers, none of them were violent people, and she managed to manipulate them to do this gruesome act. But she used different techniques of manipulation to achieve her ends. For example, with Prevatelli, it was quite clear that uh, there was a full-blown sexual relationship. She was quite clearly using the sexual relationship as the basis on which to manipulate Prevatelli to behave in a particular way. With the Dutchman, Roel Thomason, he believed, for example, that Prevatelli was no longer on the scene, so she was withholding information from him as a way of manipulating him to behave in a particular way that she wanted. And then finally you have Cassidy, who commits the murder, but is not interested in sadomasochism at all, but she presents herself to him as if she's an abused woman and that he therefore can be the hero of the hour by wiping out the abuser Brearley. For Philip Brierley's family, the mystery of his disappearance may have been solved, but the pain of their loss will never go away. The family are still, I don't know the word's angry, but for, you know frustrated at what went on, disbelieving still in a way um, that this could have taken place. Philip's sister still recalls that moment that she last saw him, the, the happy family that she saw drive away that night. As for Tracy Seward, alias the Stiletto Goddess, she received a life sentence. The great manipulator finally couldn't scheme her way out of this one. I don't think she thought she could do the perfect murder, but I do think she thought she could get other people more blamed than her. I think she thought she could blame it on Cassidy and she could blame it on Roald Thomason and she could then disappear into the uh, evening sun with Prevatelli. It's 
quite clear, without the internet existing, Seward would never have met Prevatelli. The fantasy of uh, what used to be a furtive and secret world of sadomasochism moves out of fantasy and goes into reality. And again, I doubt if that would have happened had it not been for the way the internet propelled this group of people into taking that fantasy one step further, taking that fantasy into reality, a reality that led to somebody being murdered.